I got these cockroaches running like coaches in the NFL. Quarterback in order, stacking my graphs like a Seth QL. Got more scales than Anaconda that's been checking its weight, and the Chardon's automatic, so you better grab your plate. Gonna serve up some workarounds, that's home style. I'm a home skillet, making data indestructible, that's ludicrous, saying is that Lorenzo kid it? Ain't no baloney, that's Dylan O'Mahoney from Bo's giving you his trust. Ain't no phony like Holden Caulfield, homie. We got Jim Walker, who's a ranger, and he's a must. Bust in the bubble of this distribution trouble. We've got the craft to get on a raft and escape the rubble. Might call it Barney, but you know what? That I love you, you love they. We're all part of the D-O-K. What's that? What's the D-O-K? It's my community. So with a great big hug and a tweet from me to you, won't you say you'll make my database new? Welcome everyone to the 24th Data on Kubernetes Meetup. Uh, my name is Bart Farrell. It's always a pleasure to be hosting. Um, today we have three fantastic guests and we have one very, very exciting piece of news. But before we get into that, as with every webinar, I always want to remind people that you can get in our Slack, you can go to our webpage, dok.community, you can check us out on Twitter, uh, also on LinkedIn, also on Instagram. We do lots and lots of different stuff related to tech, also related to culture, art, and music, which will also be blending in today a little bit. Um, and always want to remind you that we are open for ideas, we're open for speakers, we've got speakers booked all the way through the end of February. But now because of popular demand, we're also gonna be adding a meetup in Brazil for Portuguese speakers. We're also gonna be adding one at the end of this month uh, for folks in the Netherlands. I did one earlier today for uh, our uh, people in our community that are in Asia um, to fit with their timetable. So we wanna make sure that everyone is included, no matter what language you speak, no matter where you happen to be in the world, we're always interested in hearing fresh ideas um, from practitioners, from C-level folks from all different kinds of people out there that are working with, uh, with Kubernetes that are embracing this challenge of running data on Kubernetes. We're gonna be hearing a lot of interesting information from people that work at a great company that have been dealing with this for, we can say a substantial period of time if we're looking at the, uh, the Kubernetes lifespan. Um, so with that in mind, uh, you know, most of the time, you know, we have somebody really special with you. You might say this person needs no introduction, but I would say that Jim Walker definitely does. Uh, from the background information that I've been getting about Jim, the more I hear about him, the more interested I am. I think if Jim were from the, if Jim were British, I'm pretty sure he would probably be a knight um, by now. Apart, apart from that, just because of being a wonderful person with a, a generous spirit, has an interesting story with, uh, with tech in terms of how he got involved in it um, through his education, starting out uh, with was it TI-99, I think it was, and then moving on to a Commodore. Um, and then working in a, working on two school newspapers. I got to give a big shout out to Pop because I got a lot of this information from the podcast. Um, but anyway, Jim's been on the tech side, the business side. He wears many hats. In terms of how he defines himself, he translates tech into English. And so today he's going to be translating a lot of these seemingly complex ideas about running data on Kubernetes and a distributed database. Um, into more practical, more tangible ideas. Um, he's also accompanied by Keith and Lisa Marie. And uh, Keith, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm uh, Keith McClellan. I'm uh, one of the solutions engineers at, at Cockroach Labs. Um, I've been in the cloud native space now for about five years. I was a Mesos guy before I was a, a Kubernetes guy. So I've been doing this for quite a bit of time. So I'm looking forward to, to talking with folks here today. Perfect, thank you, Keith. And also Lisa. Hi, thanks, Bart. Yes, I am Lisa. I know many of you uh, through the community. I've been a CNCF ambassador for a while and running the Cloud Native Containers Group. So welcome all of you that are coming through the Cloud Native Containers Group. And I just have to say to the DOK uh, community, you are very lucky to have Bart and Demetrius organizing your community. I've been doing this a very long time and I have to say, they are top-notch, professional, they, seriously, Bart, one of the best meetup organizers I have had the pleasure of working with. So thank you for hosting us today. Thanks, Lisa. It's because of working with great folks like you that this, for me, comes rather naturally and easily. Um, that being said, and after my brief, my brief introduction for Jim, uh, Jim, the floor is yours. Uh, we'd like to hear about just a quick summary about your first experience working with Kubernetes, and then we can jump right into your presentation. Sounds great. I will share a screen. I'm going to share a presentation. Um, 
And I will give a little bit of context of what we're going to do here. I am joined again by a couple of people here, which is actually, uh, I, I'm just honored to have them with me. Um, but first of all, thank you to Barton Demetrius who, for, for having me uh, to present on this. Um, you know, this is, what I wanted to present today is, uh, you know, the architecture of a distributed database. Now, the reason I'm doing it this way and not like a more of a Kubernetes angle thing is I think there's a lot to be learned in what our engineering team has been through. Uh, in terms of a lessons learned in terms of how you think about your applications and some of the things that we've been through in building this over the past five years, because I think we're all building distributed systems. That, that's nat natively what we're all doing here on this call. So that's kind of the, the take on this. Now, I'm going to talk about the architecture of the database, um, which hopefully is valuable from that point of view. I think and I know, uh, you know, there's going to be a fair amount of stuff about Kubernetes here as well and a lot of questions. Now, Keith, who has joined me, um, Keith, he, under, he undersold himself. Keith is a, a phenomenal engineer. Uh, he's a sales engineer, but you know, there's the people in sales who actually get what happens and actually makes the sales happen. That, that's Keith. And um, you know, he has incredible knowledge. He's helped build our operator. He's been involved in you know, hundreds of Kubernetes implementations. I think you know, we were trying to get multi-cluster Kubernetes working and you know, using Submariner to get networking going and stuff. And there's a lot of like nuance in terms of how you actually can build out a federated clusters. Uh, we're doing that actually with Cockroach and long story short, Keith has been instrumental in actually figuring out kind of, you know, what does a multi-region database look like, multi-cluster database. And so Keith can get into a lot of those details. I'm not gonna get into the details of like Kubernetes configs and all that in, in my side of the presentation, however, Keith is here on chat to answer some of that stuff as things comes up in chat and QA. So please do ask questions um, in either place. Um, I'm monitoring both places. I may ask if there's a great question, Keith, I may ask you to come on and let's talk about it. I think, um, you know, I kind of want to be a little bit fluid. There's a lot to talk about here and I think there's some really interesting things. And then Lisa is here as well to actually talk about things in our community. Um, Lisa runs DevRel for Cockroach Labs and uh, has been an ambassador for the CNCF uh, Lisa also runs the largest, it's the largest CNCF meetup on the planet, right? Right, Lisa? I think I so. I believe right? it still is. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, the Bay Area, right? So a uh, huge community organizer. And I'm just, I'm honored to be with them. But but first of all, um, you know, thank you to to the team here at the DOK community. Um, data on Kubernetes is something that's very near and dear to my heart. And so I, I am at a database company because A, well, I'm originally a developer. B, I just believe databases are a critical part of infrastructure. And if we're going to talk about infrastructure and we're going to talk about Kubernetes, then we have to talk about the database as well. I just simply don't believe that Kubernetes is going to work unless somebody re-architects the database. And that's how I ended up at Cockroach Labs. Um, about four years ago, um, I was at a company called CoreOS. And if you're not familiar with CoreOS, you, it kind of should be, they really helped drive the, the, the early days of the Kubernetes community. In fact, uh, along with uh, Joseph Jacks, who actually created the very first KubeCon, I was, I was at that KubeCon with Joseph and Joseph pulled me into the Kubernetes community. He was at a company called, he had started a company called Kismatic. When I saw what was going on, I couldn't believe it. I had to be part of it, right? I, I just, I saw the future. I saw what Brandon Phillips once called Google infrastructure for everybody. And that's what's going on. And, and we're seeing this kind of this mass adoption of Kubernetes. Now, what I found when I got to CoreOS was that it was a struggle, right? Like, you know, stateless applications, sure, no problem. But like, I'm sorry, but I've been coding for a long time. You need a database. And so what I saw when I first saw Cockroach Labs was Spencer, our CEO on stage with the, with the guy who was running OpenStack at the time. I'm totally Brian, so I'm, I'm totally flaking his name. And Alex Polvey, who was the CEO of Cockroach Labs, and they spun up, you know, eight instances, all on different laptops, uh, all running on OpenStack. You, basically, one single database across eight laptops, and they would just start bringing laptops down, and the thing would come back. Sound familiar, right? It sounds like Kubernetes, right? And so this is basically a database that was built with the same core primitives that somebody would build a distributed system like Kubernetes on. And honestly, it is a direct descendant of Google Cloud Spanner. So if you think about you know, back in the day, you know, the, the infrastructure was, well, Google had a whole bunch of servers and then they built Borg. And if you're not familiar with Borg, go check it out. It's pretty amazing. Like, and, and the descendant of Borg is Kubernetes. Well, Google also built a database, a relational database called Spanner, and it was running on Borg. 
And so if you look at this, we are basically direct descendant of Spanner. In fact, we took the white paper from Spanner and a lot of the core principles you'll see here are the same core principles that, that are in Spanner. We've extended it a fair amount. So if you think about like Borg to Spanner, Kubernetes to CockroachDB is the way that we like to think about it. This was a database built for this. And I think this is the key that unlocks a lot of workloads to run on Kubernetes. I think networking, security, um, storage, you know, some of these kind of traditional things that are challenging Kubernetes, they're still a challenge. I think we're, we're fixing those things as a community. I think the SIGs are working hard. I think, you know, the CNCF is, is, is ushering along a lot of great projects that are actually kind of addressing these things. But when I look at data, data is a tough one. Um, it's tricky because at the core of a database, especially a relational database, you can't lose data. And how do you deal with data in the ephemeral world? Uh, you got to re-architect the whole thing. And so that's really how I ended up here. Um, so just wanted to give you a little background on kind of how I got here. And again, please use the chat and everything else um, in the uh, in, in, in chat and QA. Um, and we'll talk about both things. But thanks, guys, again, for inviting me. And I'm really happy to uh, go into this. So why another database? I don't really need to talk about this. Relational databases simply were not built for distributed environments. No SQL databases why built for, for distributed environments. Basically, when they built them, they took off the rails of transactions and said, great, free reign, whatever, eventually consistent, no problem. Um, funny enough, you know, databases need to hold data, especially in relational kind of system of record type workloads, even in your basic workloads. I think developers don't think about, you know, isolation levels in databases. And, you know, there, we see people using kind of these, some of these NoSQL solutions and, uh, there are big problems with those in terms of data security, I think is one, but then really what you're actually giving to your customer. And so ultimately a, a new breed of databases emerged over the past couple of years. There's a few of us that are doing this. Um, you know, you could go check them out. I mean, Fauna is one, Foundation DB, that team has done an amazing job. They went into Apple, then they're back out again. Um, Yugabyte's kind of taken Postgres and made it distributed a little bit. Um, and so there's kind of this re-architecting from the ground up to be something called distributed. Now, I feel it's just an evolution of the database with five, five, I'm sorry, five key requirements. Number one, if it's a database, it's got to implement SQL. So that top layer, that API has got to be SQL. I think that's what we all speak. Number two, it's got to ease scale, a core primitive of a distributed system, scale very easily, right? Node-based system. Number three, it has to be always on and resilient. It has to be able to survive failures just like our ephemeral workloads, right? Number four, it needs to provide ACID compliant distributed transactions, not a transaction in, in, in a stovepipe and it's going to communicate it out asynchronously to everybody else because then you have latencies, right? It's got to be real time and serializable in our opinion. And that's that's kind of what we've done. And then finally, I think this is the most important of all requirements of anything distributed and, and for a database or your system as well. You have to think about location because latency is a real problem. Um, you know, when you start dealing with the speed of light, uh, you know, that, that's what we're dealing with in this community in Kubernetes. And that's the stuff, that's one of the biggest challenges. So I feel that's a core requirement because if you could actually locate data close to a user, you can tie down and you can actually mitigate some of the latency issues. And so we've architected a lot here. I'm going to go under the covers to show you actually how we did this. But again, all of it is very well aligned with some of the core primitives of a cloud native distributed system. And that's exactly what we built, a cloud native distributed database. So um, again, this is just a relational database. It's a node-based architecture in the background. It is familiar with SQL. Uh, this is wire compatible with Postgres. Uh, we implement a large amount of the SQL syntax as well. Um, simply scale, scale, you simply add nodes to it and Cockroach will auto balance where data lives. Data in Cockroach is written in triplicate. We use Raft to manage all of this. Uh, I'm gonna show you that a little bit. Uh, we could scale further. We could scale across regions as well. Uh, we can have one single database, one single logical database, uh, you know, uh, span multiple different regions. So you could have, uh, I have, uh, this is a typo. It's not region one US West. This is actually should be US East, US West, US Central. So ask any node and can find the data across the entire system, but we can also do it across multi-clouds or multiple clusters, right? Kubernetes clusters are pretty cool. Um, and then naturally resilient, if, an, if a node or a region or whatever you want to, whatever you want to survive um, fails, we can actually deal with that. Again, data is written in triplicate, so we can actually get to this point where we have zero RPO. And then any node in Cockroach is a single consistent gateway to the entirety of the database. So let's say I'm writing data in triplicate. Here's three customer records, Kimball, Mattis, and Stuart. These are uh, executives at our company, right? 
and I'm asking for this data and I'm in the West and they actually, the data lives over in Europe or central, this should be. Um, this, this node knows how to actually find that data uh, wherever it lands. So it is a single logical database and each node actually re represents that. However, you kind of want to locate data closer to a user so we can actually tie data to a, to a location so that I have this low latency access to data as well. All right, so let's get another cover. So I'm at 15 minutes past the hour. I'm going to talk a little bit quickly. Again, QA, chat along the way. Uh, thanks for being patient, Keith, and getting me through that intro. Um, but time to shine, baby. All right, so ultimately under the covers, the way that Cockroach stores data is in KV. All records are in this monolithic key space, right? So everything is ordered based on basically the key of that particular table. Now, in old databases, what we would do, let's say the inventory table, we would just keep appending data to a table, right? On the right-hand side. And then we create an index that's alphabetized by whatever it is we want to do, let's say by name, and we're able to actually access that data. So you get this overlay index that sits on top of a table, right? And that's cool. That worked for a long time. This doesn't work in distributed systems because now we have these complex undertaking of actually dealing with indexes and where data lives. Ultimately, we implement a KV store at the storage layer. We have a SQL execution layer that sits in between that and then a SQL API on top. We're translating KV to relational. So that just appears to be a relational database, everything that you would ever know before. Now, we take advantage of some very powerful primitives that are in KV. Um, and this allows us to do some really cool things. Let me just dive into it because I think it actually will help you understand how this all works. Um, so again, all data is stored in this way. And the key in the KV store um, this is a great simplification of this. This is all encoded. You can actually encode a lot of things into the key is basically the table an index, uh, the key that you're looking for, and then a column name. And then for each value, the value is actually the column value. So the way that this looks in a database is we could say, here's a table, the dogs table underneath. And we store this, here's some entries. This is the way it looks, right? We take this, this first record, Carl, and this is actually broken down into K two KV entries dog, the table, the ID, and then the, the column name and the value is Carl. Again, for weight 10.1, right? And so what we're doing is we're basically now appending records and inserting records into the right place so that we're maintaining this, this lexicographical order of everything in the database, right? So we, I ordered it over here, but if I wanna insert things, I'm gonna insert it into the right place. Now this allows us to do some really cool things. It automates the way we shard, um, it allows us to basically replicate things uh, and there's some, some really cool stuff beyond this, right? And so, but we gain some cool things, um, you know, when we do, we don't have to do like full table scans, which would suck in a distributed system because you'd have to go look at everywhere to actually look at this data. It's why, you know, analytics in a Kubernetes environment is a little tricky, right? Because do you want to go touch every single node to actually find what's going on across huge, massive table scans, that sort of stuff. Um, but we get these mass efficiencies through this, 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 this sorting, right? So let's talk about how we then store this data. So each table is divided into these contiguous, actually we changed this. It was 64 megabyte ranges. We actually changed it to 256. This is, I have to update the slide. Um, and what we've done is we've created these, these ranges which are kind of basically chunks of data in a table that are easy enough and efficient enough for us to move around, right? We can move them, we can split them. And if you think about a range, think about this as just a shard. That's the easiest way for me to think about it, right? And so if you're going to break down a table and I'm going to, I'm going to push this data out into all different places, well, I need an index structure so I can actually find where data lives, like which range is that data in. And so we've implemented an index structure. It's much like a B tree and allows us to actually, you know, access data and understand where it lives within a cluster. So again, we can do efficient things like range scans. I don't need to look at every single range. I could look at just the ranges that I want to do these sort of things. If I wanted to find all dogs between Muddy and Stella. Um, but when we insert data, what's really cool is I can say, okay, great. I have a new record. I want to insert Sunny into my dogs table. I'm going to say, okay, great. It's in the third range. I'm going to come over here and say, insert Sunny. Is, is range available? Yes, there is there's space. Great, cool. Awesome, insert that record. Step two, now I want to insert another record for Ruby. I come over and I look at this range and I say, wait a second, there's no space here. I've hit my 256 megabit limit. What do I do? Well, what happens underneath the covers is Cockroach DB basically splits that range. It splits the shard automatically and says, great, now create two. And let me insert that record. I have plenty of space. I'm going to insert Rudy and I'm going to be successful. 
right? So what I've done is just automated this entire sharding process, right? So as a database grows, you can imagine tens of thousands of ranges are distributed across multiple different nodes. We manage and understand where all that data lives in the cluster so that we can actually A, make it live near you, or B, make it survive. And we use these ranges to do this, right? And so we're automating this thing. We can actually then, you know, if the database, if the database reduces in size, we can actually compile ranges together over time. We don't do this in real time either. Like if you insert a record. Um, it isn't going to say like, oh, wait, I got to hold off this transaction while I split this range. We actually let it go over the 256 megabit limit so that, you know, we can be very efficient and come back and clean it up when transactions aren't happening um, on that particular range, right? And so there's some kind of cool things that we've done in here that are, that are going on. So um, so let's talk about Raft. Um, and Demetrius, uh, what are, or I'm sorry, Bart, one of your original questions to me in an email was like, you know, there's Raft versus Paxos. And I think I think for everybody on the on the phone, if you if you aren't familiar with Raft and Paxos, and you're on this conversation, I'd be surprised. Um, honestly, the, these are kind of core algorithms that are driving these distributed systems. Um, Paxos is pretty complex. I think the implementation of Paxos uh, can get really complex. Uh, we chose Raft. It was a simpler way to get them going. And fun. In fact, Ben Darnell, who's one of our founders, who man, Ben Ben was actually instrumental in building Colossus at at Google. Uh, ben is an amazing, probably one of the best engineers I've ever worked with in my life. He, he's brilliant. Um, it, he's quoted as saying, "You know, in undergrad, I could, I could, I could have coded, ra I could have coded Raft overnight. It's taken me five years to build a production-ready version of Raft. Um, so it, it, it's honestly, it can be very simple, and it may may appear simple. Uh, it's the corner cases that kill you when you're implementing things like this uh, in production. And so." If you aren't familiar with Raft, really Raft is a, it's a distributed consensus protocol um, and it allows us to basically provide atomic rights and consistent reads across uh, shards of data or ranges of data. Um, in Raft, a Raft group basically is comprised of, 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 of copies of data. This is that blue range, right? In the dog table, it was that 256 group, right? So um, here we have it configured for three uh, triplet, three replicas, right? And so, Honestly, one of the replicas is going to be very special, and it will be a leaseholder. And the leaseholder basically runs everything for that particular uh, replica set. Um, it allows us to basically have this atomic replication of commands, right? So I can actually say, hey, leaseholder, do this. And the leaseholder is going to ensure that the replicas, the, the two followers, are exactly right based on what the leaseholder should be. And so this is a really key concept here because we actually have this quorum of replicas to acknowledge receipts. So when we write data to the database, as long as two of the three replicas are correct, great, we can acknowledge it, right? Because we have quorum. So if this was five, it'd have to be three of five. If it was seven, it'd have to be four of seven, right? And so we use Raft uh, explicitly in, in Cockroach. It's a key piece of what we're doing, right? Um, again, uh, Raft is a very, tr very chatty protocol. Um, there's heartbeats going on all the time. There's hundreds of thousands of ranges and some clusters. Uh, and we basically manage all of this uh, underneath the covers for everybody. There's some really interesting things that we've done. In fact, this, inter this conversation is great. Um, there's also a paper that we wrote. Um, we published a paper to Sigmod. Oh, gosh, I don't know. It, it was probably like March 30, like March 89th or something like that. I think it was in the summer. I don't know, you guys. I, I forget when that was done. It could be last year. Time is so weird right now. Um, but we have a Sigma paper that talks about our distributed system and, and what we've done. Um, we'll have to find that and get it out to everybody, but it's pretty, pretty valuable. Um, and it goes through a lot of kind of how this all works in, in a deeper kind of uh, way, deeper than me, the simple marketing guy can talk to because the engineers, man, they're pretty solid stuff going on. So, okay. So we use Raft then, right? So I've talked about the storage layers, KV. We, we're going to translate that now into SQL and, and show how this works and we're, how we actually distribute data, right? I showed you the, the KV to, to, to kind of SQL and how tables are actually dispelled. Um, but now we have a cluster of data and how do you actually distribute data across multiple different nodes in a cluster, right? So we can do some really cool things. These replicas, right? That raft group, the three replicas. Um, we can actually store this data and, and place it in, in, in various different place in various different nodes, right? Nodes within a Kubernetes cluster, right? Because these each node can be running in a pod, right? This is a containerized database, right? But we can actually basically 
push data based on what we want to survive or how fast we want access to data. So when you think about a database, traditionally, we think about the logical data model, right? Like we think about tables and indexes, referential integrity and all stuff. That's still very important in Cockroach. There's two other things you need to think about, and that's really the, the physical model, right? Where data lives, because I want to actually survive certain things, or where data lives, because I want fast access to the data. And on each table, we can actually control where data is going to live in that cluster. So the physical model of data actually becomes really, really important, right? And so let's just talk about diversity. Typically, this is the way we think about it. It's the easiest way to think. Here's four nodes. It's running on Kubernetes. Um, each of these things is it's running in its own pod, you could imagine. And I'm going to actually distribute the data and I'm going to write this table across these four nodes and we're just going to write it so that it's kind of evenly placed, right? So from a volume point of view, right? So I have the same amount of storage being used across each of these nodes, right? And so that's cool. I've also distributed it so that if one of the nodes fails, I can still survive that. We'll come back to that, right? But I can also do things that are very interesting and the database does this underneath the covers automatically. We use heuristics to say, hey, if there's a if there's a range that's being overloaded, that's being you know hit more than ever because you know Muddy, who is my 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 dog, she's not with us anymore. But if you know everybody wants the Muddy record because it's the best dog ever, um, and let's say there's heavy heavy traffic traffic on that range, we'll actually segment that range into nodes that have less utilization and and put them off, so we get better uh, performance, right? And so we're doing these things underneath the covers. And we're using kind of real-time usage metrics, and, and these are heuristics actually under the covers of Cockroach to actually intelligently understand where these things are happening. All cool stuff that's been developed over the past couple of years. So we can also do things like write data to a particular location. Now, when we write data to a location, what we're doing is we're overloading the key. Remember I said the key had the table and the, the key and the value and all this stuff. But what we do is what we add to the key is we add one of the columns, right? One of the values in the column. So in this case, I'm going to add the location. EU, like Germany, uh, I'm going to add, you know, New York, I'll add, you know, California, whatever, right? And so if we can take a value that's in the row of data, embed that in the key, what happens is everything gets ordered. And now I know that all the records that are German are in one set of ranges. I know all the records that have to be in US East are in one set of range. And I can actually segment that data. And as long as I've named each of the nodes, the database is smart enough to say, hey, this data goes on that node. I can tie data to a location. Now, this is a this is a capability that when I first saw this, I basically just, I. I shook my head. I couldn't believe what was going on, right? Like we can control where data lives. Now people love it because of compliance, I think is one of the ways that people think about this. So how do we deal with things like GDPR in a distributed environment, right? Um, but I, it, it's, we designed it because of the latency, the performance issues, right? Because latency is a real thing, okay? The speed of light is not to be messed with. Um, and there's only so much you can do. You know, human acceptable real time is, is about a hundred milliseconds. There's a hundred millisecond rule. It was a, it was actually it was defined by the by the guy who created Gmail at uh, Google, Paul. Oh my God, I, I I always mess up his name. Bechtel or Bechtel? It's not Bechtel. I don't know. Look up a hundred millisecond rule. But but it's a it's a real thing, especially in distributed systems. You could imagine in this case each one of these clusters running uh, its own kind of Kubernetes cluster. So do you really need one federated Kubernetes cluster across the entire planet, or do you just run three of them. Now, typically we're going to do this all in one region because this latency thing, you know, you would have more nodes or more clusters in Europe. This is a, you guys, I don't want you to take this slide literally. This is a marketing slide. Sorry about this. Um, but there's a lot of things that you have to play with from latency point of view that once you get into Cockroach, you start to understand latencies. It's actually a really exciting topic. And we get into that. I, Keith could tell you exactly how to actually architect something that's truly global, right? You would probably have you know, four clusters in Europe, you probably have four clusters in the US. There's a lot of tricks. Actually, our docs gets into this extensively. Um, the, the docs at Cockroach Labs, in fact, every time I present, I think I talk about our documentation team, don't I, Keith? I, I pretty much every time, right? Um, the, the docs at, go on, sorry, buddy. I was gonna say multiple times, every mm -hmm. time we talk. I think it's well, the thing you say more frequently than anything else. I, well, I, I, that and latency, I think. Um, and distributed, I think distributed would be big on my like my word cloud, right? Um, but our docs team does an amazing job. And I've been at several different open source companies. Um, and 
I think one of the key things that actually holds back open source projects is documentation. And, and so if you really want to go check out some world-class docs, go check our stuff. There is a section in there that talks about database topology and the way that we think about this stuff. Um, it's a great read. Jesse and team does a great job. Um, everything that I'm talking about here is outlined there, how transactions work. Uh, it's, it's a great deep dive into everything that's going on in the database. So, um, uh, what else did I want to say? That, that's, that's, so that's latency, right? And so we can actually control where data lives. Now that's a, I, I've never heard of that in a database, right? We can also basically rebalance data, right? So if, if something happens and I say, I want to add, I want to just scale out the cluster, right? Okay. I spin up a new instance of cockroach on a pod and deploy it in that cluster. And I pointed at the other, I pointed at the cluster of nodes. And it simply basically rebalances things. It takes data and rebalances the data. So I have now basically resharded the entire database. You think about this. this is, I don't know if anybody here has any manually sharding of a database. It's an absolute nightmare, let alone contracting it. Uh, we automate all of this in the background, right? And so it's just going to take care of this. Raft is a, is a key player in this whole thing, right? And so we're basically, um, basically decomposing data and then moving the replica over into another node. Again, kind of a key concept and something that we learned over time and kind of a core principle of what we actually de define here, scale is a primitive in distributed systems. Resilience is also a primitive, right? And how do you survive a failure, right? So if a node goes down, Raft realizes that, hey, I'm missing one of my replicas and it says, great, let me, let me actually survive this, right? And so what we can do is we'll basically say, hey, look at those two replicas are gone. After, Keith, what is the timeout? Is it five minutes? Yeah, it's by default, it's five minutes, but it's configurable depending on um, specific database needs. Right. And so after five minutes, if the, if, the, if the replica set, if the leaseholder is like, I can't find this replica, I can't find this replica, I'm still committing because I have two of three, right? I can still access that data. I can still commit transactions. I have two of three, but I'm, I'm missing my third person. I, I don't know where it is. It's like after five minutes, we'll kill the node and we'll, we'll rewrite those replicas on other nodes. Now, you don't want to always do that because it's kind of harsh uh, and it creates a lot of traffic between these nodes and a lot of, you know, in and out of stuff. And so what we can do is actually is sometimes, you know, nodes will go down temporarily. It'll go down for a minute and come back, right? Or 30 seconds and come back. And so we can basically replay what's happened in that replica set and, and make sure that, that that third replica is up to date. And so we, it's elegant in the way that we do that, right? And so if you think about this, this is one of the cool things that we can do here. If you think about scale and you think about this resilience thing that I'm talking about, think about this with uh, rolling upgrades. Isn't this the same way that Kubernetes works, right? I have a pod, I bring it down and I bring it back up with a new version. I can have multiple versions of, of Kubernetes running in a single cluster in each of the pods, right? And so I can now do these kind of rolling upgrades and rolling upgrades is a key feature of how we think about deploying software on Kubernetes, right? And so for us, it's very natural. I could lose a, a replica for five minutes, bring it back, and the, the, the database has survived that completely resilient. So it's very well aligned. Um, again, we can have multiple versions of, of CockroachDB running in a single cluster. I think we're backwards compatible to two versions. Oh, gosh, Keith, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's what's at. Yeah. Um, so so generally speaking, um, we, we, have, we have kind of two components here. There's the data that lives in the stateful set, and then there is the, the binary that's actually hosting that right. data. There's, an, um, there's a declarative command to finalize an upgrade, which is what actually changes the metadata to a new version. Prior to that, um, a new binary can read old metadata back, I think you're right, two major, two feature releases effectively. So um, that allows us to do rolling upgrades and whatnot, and then finalize that upgrade when we've decided that um, we're not planning on going back. That's right. Thank you for being here. God, man, it feels so good to get a break. I was really on a roll there. Too. So, but, but I, you know, the staple sets is a key way in which we actually manage it. It's actually a really, really important point for, you know, anybody who's thinking about deploying applications like Kubernetes and thinking about state and, and how that works and understanding how staple sets for us, it's a key piece of the way that we deploy as, as Keith just mentioned. Um, and, and very, very important concept. I remember when it was first introduced in the, the Kubernetes community, it was, it was bigger than, than we thought at the time, but actually it, it unlocks a whole lot of very, very interesting workloads. For us, 
it unlocks the database. Uh, and we've architected something that's very, very resilient in scale, just, just as we spoke about here. Now, so if you're gonna implement a database, right? We've talked about storage, we've talked about how data gets distributed, how we can deal with scale resilience, right? Um, transactions are tough. Uh, and, and you know, we have been building out a distributed transaction engine for a SQL database for the last five and a half years now. And, and these things are not simple. And it's when you build a database, it's the corner cases that kill you. Um, you know, it's like the straight through path. You're all developers. You you know when when you do the straight through function is real easy. It's all the odd things that can go wrong that that are tricky. Now what I'm going to go through is basically a real high level overview of how transactions work in a distributed environment. Now again in our docs, point two Keith, we'll keep keep track there, right? Um, uh, the the life of a transaction section of our docs is uh, goes through this in in intimate detail uh, and a little bit better than I can here. But I'm going to give you the straight path when things don't fail. And when everything goes exactly right for a fairly simple transaction. Now, remember a SQL transaction when it comes through, um, basically this, this insert gets broken down into many different statements, right? One SQL statement, actually, I'm sorry, one SQL statement gets broken down into multiple different transactions, right? There's lots of different steps. Anybody here who's on the phone who's a DBA is going to be like, yep, got it. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, I think as developers, this is uh, something that we, we, we forget about. Um, and it's kind of one of these things where we don't even think uh, that, that underneath the covers is a whole bunch of complexity. There's a lot of complexity in a SQL state. This is a really simple one. Now, for us, when we think about, you know, an ACID database, isolation is a big thing, right? So when I think about Cockroach and, and what we've done in our database, we've really kind of, we, we, we've, we've optimized for two things. Number one, the speed of life, right? Because that's no joke. You can't get past that, right? And number two is consistency. Right, and so this, like, so in the cap theorem, it's it's we're CP, right, Keith? That's right. Thank you. Okay, uh, man, if I got that wrong, it would kill me, right? <laughs> so if you think about cap theorem, we are definitely a CP, and and we've actually optimized on consistency as well. And so how do you make sure that data is correct and it performs very well? Now availability, sometimes you know we we're going to survive 95, 98 percent of the failures that you're going to have, like, and so but. When we optimize, we want to make sure that these two very difficult problems are going to be solved. A, you're going to get data very quickly, right? And B, we're always going to guarantee that that data is correct. Now, you can do some of these things with like, some of the NoSQL databases, but again, your mix and what you're doing in the cap theorem is a little bit different. So depending on your workload, this is what you do or don't want to do, right? And so we have definitely erred on the side of consistency. So we're thinking about, you know, system of record type workloads. Even in any general database workloads will work very well on Cockroach and it's still gonna automate all the scale and resilience and you get all the benefits, right? So I think even as a general purpose database, we work pretty damn well, right? And so how do transactions work? So I'm gonna insert two records into this dogs table that we've been using. You'll see my ranges are about here. Um, I have my leaseholders, which are the wrap leaders. Uh, they're identified in, in the darker gray that's around those three ranges. Um, and so I have the data, it's, it's written across four different nodes. Now, when I write, when I create this SQL statement, I'm going to break it down. So the first statement is begin transaction, great. When by begin transaction, I'm going to talk to the first range and I'm going to say, hey, create a pending record for this transaction. Now, if you look at the data in the KV stores, basically there's a bunch of special records in Cockroach where this is actually getting logged for that particular range. And so we're actually writing this transaction and the status of it is pending. Now there's a bunch of status in there. And, you can get deep into kind of how we implement this. It's actually really, really cool as a developer. I would go and check out how we actually implement transactions under the covers. Um, it's pretty, it's pretty bad. Um, and I think it might give you some interest in terms of how you think about systems, especially in this, this complex networking of, of systems. And so how we actually do is pretty cool. So I'm gonna first, I'm gonna write the first record. So great, I'm gonna go out and, and what it does is the leaseholder is gonna say, hey, go, go look at my replicas and say, hey, can you guys write this? now? I depict this record in yellow because it's kind of a temporary write, right? And what we're doing is we're writing that. And as soon as that acknowledgement comes back from one of my replicas, I'm like, great, I can go on to the next statement because I have two of three in terms of a quorum write has now been completed. Now, the second set is I have this, okay, now I need to write the second record, which is obvious. It goes out, it talks to its, its two replicas. As soon as the acknowledgement comes back, one of them, I have two of three, great. I now have, confirmation from two or three of both of the records that have to be in, I have form, right? I can now change this transaction, this temporary record to commit, 
And I can say now back to the to the requesting user, whoever that was, I can acknowledge this thing works. Super simple, super straightforward. Now, two things I didn't mention. First of all, this gateway that's here, it's in green because it could have been any one of these nodes. It's not some special node. Like this is going to interact with like, any node one, node two, node three, or node four. I'm just visually writing it as its own thing, right? And and so again, any node can actually service a read or a write. So I can actually scale both reads and writes. So some of these cloud augmented databases will implement like a distributed storage underneath, you know, one write node with a bunch of reads that are reading off a pool and they control writes through a single kind of stove pipe, <laughs> AWS, right? And so you're going to have a, a bottleneck for writes, right? And so for us, let's distribute and get, get you know, uh, proper latencies for both reads and writes across across everything. Okay, um, one of the tricks here, um, you know, you kind of got a, um, you're going to run into a little bit more retries um, when you implement this sort of thing. Um, so putting retry logic around your queries is a is a key thing. I know it's a best practice. A lot of developers don't do it. I think uh, everybody should do it. It's something I never did. I don't know. I was a lazy developer. I was a hack. Um, so. Um, kind of important thing though, because uh, you are going to get that because you're going to get conflicts, right? So when somebody writes a record in New York, somebody writes a record in Sydney, and it's on the same record, how do we guarantee that that's going to happen despite the latency between those two? We can do that, right? So, okay, that was transactions. We're 1040. I got about 10 more minutes. I think we'll have, definitely have time for some questions at the end. This is great. So, so let's now talk about execution. So I talked about storage, right? How we actually store data. Remember, this is SQL. It just looks like it looks like Postgres basically um, to the to the end user and to the developer, right? But in between, all this kind of magic is happening, um, including the execution of queries, right? And so we think about execution in a distributed environment. My first kind of impression of this was when I joined Hortonworks back in, oh gosh, it was 2011, I think I joined that company. Uh, when I started learning about MapReduce and, and some of the same kind of core concepts, are you familiar with that? Is kind of what we're implementing under the covers here. Now we we built our entire database from the ground up. This isn't MapReduce. The entire thing is is built in Go, uh, including the storage layer, which we actually we used RocksDB for a while. We actually just reinserted. We built something called Pebble, which is an implementation of that in Go. So this is entirely in Go land, right? And so the entire execution layer uh, is done as well, right? And so we're using KV to store stuff, um, and then we're using SQL and we're pushing computation down to the data. Right? And we're going to de decompose a query into the right pieces based on data boundaries. Uh, and, and let me show you kind of how that works. Right? So let's do a select count. Uh, it's a, kind of a basic analytical query, right? Analytical queries, you don't want to do huge range scan. You want to actually push it down to where the data lives, group it back, and bring it back. Right? And so we're doing some interesting things here. <coughs> actually, for this kind of query, uh, there's a feature we built called a uh, vectorized query, which actually allows us to do columnar. Uh, understanding of data, which is kind of cool, um, allows us to do some basic uh, analytical queries. You go check again, that's another, I'm not going to cover it here today, but um, pretty cool stuff that we did. So I want to do this select count from customers and group it by country. I can now ask any node in the entire database. For instance, I'm just asking something in the USE. It's going to actually push this out to the various different countries. I'm going to scan my customers that are living in each of those places. I'm going to do a group by country in each one of them. I'm going to count. And I'm going to bring that back to the, the, the master node, and it's going to do a reduce, right, map down. I'm going to do very similar, right, and do this group by, and it's going to bring it back to the request. <clears throat> so that's all cool. If you're familiar with databases, um, if you're familiar with, you know, production grade, awesome databases, there's also this concept of a CBO, a cost-based optimizer. Now, cost-based optimizers have been around for a long time. Um, DBAs love them. Uh, I love them. I think it's really, really cool technology. We're actually able to use uh, the location of data in the context of the cost that we're optimizing for. So typically in a CBO, you're actually just running heuristics on how where data lives within the table and like looking at indexes or there's lots of, of, of deterministic and heuristics that go into a CBO. We're adding, we have a basic cost-based optimizer, but we're adding location into this as well because that's a key thing which we actually want to optimize for in this. Again, our Sigma paper goes into this uh, uh, in depth. Uh, and so really cool software engineering there. I know Rebecca Taft on our team um, helped lead the, the build out of that paper. And if, if you really want to get some really cool insight into what you're building from some of the algorithms, I think if you're looking at our code, reading that paper, both extremely valuable. So now let's talk about latency. 
Uh, latency is no joke. Again, um, the speed of light is the speed of light. You're never going to beat it. Um, and so how do we actually deal with this in a distributed system? And these next few sections are going to be actually talk about this because performance actually has a lot to do with latency, right? And so in the old days, in the beginning, back when, you know, I, I coded, I got a Spark and I built my app and a database. And what you did is you built like, you, I remember back in the day, like you had a budget and you said, great, I'm going to build this thing in C++ and my database is going to be Oracle. And so I would go pay Oracle for whatever I had to do for that database. And then whatever money I had left over, I would optimize on the biggest machine I could possibly get. And that was the scale I got, right? And it was, and it sat underneath a desk somewhere and people hit it. Or then we moved it into a data center, which was a room in the office building, right? That, that stuff, and there was racks in it. And then we got new air conditioning in that. And then all that went away when everything went to the public cloud. And that's the challenge that people have today, right? What is infrastructure in the public cloud? Now, I'm going to argue that infrastructure is, is not just servers and load balancers and networking equipment and all shit. It's actually the database as well. I think the database is that kind of key layer where the infrastructure hits the application. Uh, and so how do you deal with, with latencies when things are all over the place, right? So let's just say we have, you know, we, this is the old school, right? So I have this database that's living down. Keith, it's almost in your neighborhood. He's over in the, in the DC area, so he's in the, he's in the Beltway. So I have a database that's running over in say Roanoke or whatever that is, um, and I have access from users say in New York. I have some people on the West Coast. Seventy milliseconds round trip. Okay, that's a really simple query. What if I have to go back and forth? Right. Um, latencies are a problem here, right? Um, and so and then basically what you're doing is you're also doing backup, right? Like so. In, a, in, a, in the traditional world, when I when I wanted to get resilience, I had this active passive system where I have an active database and then I have this passive, the secondary up and running. You've all been through this, right? Where if my primary fails, I switch over to the secondary and that's how I have this resilience. You know, I can have like data loss, RPO, RTO is no joke. Um, and so we're doing, it's actually pretty expensive too because you're actually replicating this data across, you know, the egress costs get pretty, pretty expensive in the cloud as well, right? And so. What we've done is, is is very different, right? We have a very we have an active active system where we're setting up little clusters all over the country to service basically any query, right? We can tie data to a location as well, which is actually going to really bring these things down. But now you're accessing data where you want to access it, so we can actually have this all up and running. Now we're, each one of these nodes is active. This isn't active passive. You have no need for this weird kind of two data center thing. You're actually going to want three data centers or more. Right, so you can actually have survival of data all over the place. And now I have 12 millisecond writes here, and I'm going to have basically seven milliseconds round trip plus 24 milliseconds for writes because I'm actually going to access data in different locations. Right, it's going to actually going up here. So the the graphic is real. Right, um, critical in the way that you deploy your database and thinking through latency as you deploy um, is actually really really key. I know Keith talks a lot to, about this with with customers. But again, in distributed systems, when you are collaborating across multiple different instances that are running in pods, these are the things you have to actually deal with, right? The survivability of these things and then really the, the latencies, right? What's cool is we're doing this at the table level uh, and we're configuring data um, at the table level. So here's a table, it's the customer table. And we're actually going to basically, you know, we're going to separate data out by region. We're going to actually tie data to different regions, US West, one, US West two, US Central, US West one, US East one, US East four, right? So that's basically this configuration. I can take all the values that are pushing, that are tied to West and write those to those nodes that are on the West coast, right? So they get written to the stuff in the, in the, in the left-hand side. I can take everything that's, that's denoted as Central and it's a value in that, um, in, in that particular row itself that actually ties that. Those are gonna go to Central and then finally the stuff that's gonna go to the East and go East. So it's basically, uh, it's in your create table. You're actually defining this. You're actually thinking about this, right? Because our primary key now is not just the ID, it adds in this locality, right? This locality field that's on that row, right? That's what I was talking about geo This is actually how it works in the device. Now, what's really cool is we can alter partition in real time. So now, say I added a node, I forget which node I add here. East one, east, so do my west one, west two. US Central one. Anyway, 
I can add a node. And basically with a simple alter table command, he's probably shaking his head at me right now. With a simple alter table command, I can say, I want all records that were in US Central 1. Actually, I maybe I opened up US Central 2, which is down in like Texas or something. And so all records that are like Mississippi, Texas, Oklahoma, will all be magically moved to nodes that are in that region. Um, and so this is all done under the covers without any downtime. And it's a simple alter, alter partition command on the table. And that's going to move things around, right? So, oh, here we go. Okay. So pretty cool. Uh, not only can we tie data, we can do it in real time and in production, which is pretty awesome. We can also do, you know, upgrades of schema, uh, and, you know, with no downtime, uh, this sort of stuff as well, right? Okay, so final topic here. This is a bit more cranial. Uh, and so distributed performance. So remember I said like latency is no joke. And so we're doing a couple different things. Uh, we're doing lazy transactions and we're doing write pipeline. Let me just show it to you, right? And so in, in a serial world, the way that transactions work, here's a, here's a SQL statement. I'm going to write this first transaction. It's pending. It comes back. And then I have to do the second one, Carl, and then it comes back. And so this is back and forth between multiple different nodes, right? Uh, and then I can finally commit that record. Oh, Carl comes back. Yeah, first, first of all, I have to start this transaction, then write Carl, and then write Nigel. And then finally, I'm going to finally commit this. Thing. And so there's just all this back and forth. Imagine the two, the two posts here as two nodes, right? Um, that takes a lot of time, right? Uh, and so we're going back and forth. So each one of these, again, is, is milliseconds of latency. So what we've implemented here at Cockroach is lazy and pipeline. What we're doing is we're pipelining the transaction. So we're basically saying, let's write Carl and Nigel at the same time and then commit. And so what we've done is we've saved T amount of time here. Pretty cool, right? And that's what we had done. That was the state of the art. Now, it was 19.2 or 20. It was 19.2 introduced a concept um, called parallel commit. So we're already doing this, this right pipelining, right? We're reducing the latency to two round trips. But we can actually do something that's really cool. And this comes back to, you know, how do you, how do you really simplify the speed of light? And so I can't bend the speed of light, but I can actually change the photons. That's the way I like to think of this. And so we can actually say what we're going to send over in each transaction. If I look at the, the what I want to commit and then everything around it, and I send all of that to another node and it looks at everything and says everything looks about right, acknowledge back right away, I can do some really cool things. And I basically just shrunk all of my, my, my round trips. Now, with lazy and pipeline and parallel, which we've done here. Now, this is some really cool stuff. If anybody's familiar with Jepson and what Kyle does, uh, he, he does some really amazing analysis of databases, especially in distributed systems. If you aren't, if you're not familiar with Jepson, um, go check out his reports. In fact, when he first saw it, he was like, I'm in some weird magical black box. We have since explained, he's like, pretty awesome. Um, and so dealing with the speed of light is not just about putting data close to the user. There are still transactional problems that have to cross very, very long lines. We've done some really cool things. What we're doing is let's do, let's use pipelining, right? We're going to write Carl and Nigel at the same time. But we're also at the same time, we're going to send across this transaction and in a staging um, uh, um, status, right? And basically we're going to say, hey, here's the keys. Here's the transaction. Everything goes over at once. Now everything can come back at the same time. We can commit everything at once, right? And we can return back. And so now we've saved even more time in the transaction. Now shaving off milliseconds of time is actually pretty awesome. Um, and so we don't have this kind of like commit marker in place anymore, you know, where we had to do this in kind of like two stages, right? Where we had this, the pipeline of the two things and then this commit happened separately. We can actually do all three at the same time and guarantee that that transaction is going to be correct. Now, when you're doing, you know, serializable system or record type stuff, this gets really, really important. This is the way with some of the magic we've done. Again, the Sigma paper goes into this if you really want a deeper dive into some of these things. So, um, but again, I think it's really important to look at and read just as a, you know, from an intellectual point of view as we define and design, you know, these distributed systems. I think there's a lot of algorithm protocol here that we've put into open source in our code that that absolutely people can go check out. I mean, I think. You know, open source, everybody, you know, it's funny, open source, everybody thinks about the license as the only thing. I think, you know, we have an open source license. We've modified it so that, you know, big cloud providers can't take our database and offer it as a service. But hey, we still have a large community run by Lisa with lots of different people in it. We'll still partake in communities. I'm here giving a presentation. Uh, our code is completely open to everybody. We contribute things to upstream etcd. You know, etcd is an interesting project and really the brain of Kubernetes. 
we're fixing things in NCD Raft, the Raft implementation of NCD, we've actually made a lot of con contributions there that are hopefully none of you will actually run into these problems across these broadly distributed geographic clusters, right? And so some of the stuff that we're doing at, 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 at that layer, at, you know, at this, 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 this global planetary way in which we're just pulling NCD, we hope none of you have to run into that because we're actually running into these problems in production with a lot of our customers. We're, we're contributing the stuff back upstream. So. so, okay, man, I did all that in about, it's pretty good, 35, 40 minutes. I went through the entire tech deck, right? And so we've covered everything here. Um, I did want to take a step back and say, Keith, um, I, I wanted, if you could join me as well. So um, deploying Cockroach on Kubernetes is, is, is fairly straightforward, correct? Um, and I think using stable sets and whatnot. Can you also talk about our operator that we built and how that simplifies things? Yeah, so so Cockroach DB, you know, as you mentioned on several occasions, was built from the ground up to run on Kubernetes or similar types of platforms. And so getting started with Cockroach DB on Kubernetes has always been super easy. You know, what we've discovered as we've gotten to now what two, over two hundred production customers and another probably several hundred other, you know, um, you know, open source customers uh, using CockroachDB over the past five, six years is that some of the day two operations, managing things like, you know, uh, database backups, um, you know, telemetry, metrics emissions, that kind of stuff was, was a little bit harder in Kubernetes than, than we wanted it to be. So we started working on, on building an operator to act as kind of the, the full lifecycle manager for, for CockroachDB in, in Kubernetes. And so we have a, a beta of that that's available. It's uh, on our GitHub. We're open to suggestions and contributions. Currently it's um, you know, limited to um, you know, single region deployments. So multiple data centers, multiple availability zones across a single region in a, in a single cloud provider or uh, on-prem. Um, we're um, actively soliciting contributions from the community as well as um, actively working on, on um, getting that ready for, for production workloads. Um, so would love to, to see the team uh, get some, some more feedback on that. And, and I mean, engage us in our Slack channel. We have a community Slack channel that, that Lisa is our moderator for. Um, she's very engaged in that. I think is there an operator channel in our in our community Slack channel, Keith, or is that is that the there is in our community yeah. Slack? There's a Kubernetes operator channel now for for specific operator feedback, or if you're running on Kubernetes, Cockroach DB on Kubernetes, which is our single most popular deployment mechanism. Um, there, um, if you just have a general question about the best way to get to a certain outcome on Kubernetes, happy to answer questions there as well. Yeah. And I remember when we first started, it was so funny. Two years ago when I joined Cockroach, I was like, we need an operator. We need an operator. And I remember the team, I remember Bob fought me on that. Like, you remember, Keith, it was like, well, we already built for Kubernetes. We don't need one. Yeah, I think we do for certain things. Like, you know, the core, the primitives we are, but I think there's special things that, that we actually do need it for. Uh, you know, I, I would say that the database doesn't need an operator. Right. Our interactions with third party, um, components are what drove us towards the operator. It's, right. it's making sure that our Cockroach DB pods can mount the file system or object store that we're going to be running our backups to, right. or making sure that, um, that we're, um, we're, we're making it super easy to configure like service load balancing or, or telemetry or log emissions or security. Right. right? Those are the, it's not the database that needed an operator. It's the work to support the database in a production deployment that, right. that was harder than, than we wanted it to be, which is yeah. why we invested. Yeah. And I, you know, it's funny. It's uh, when we first thought about it, I, I was at CoreOS when Brandon Phillips bought in the, the whole concept of operators. And I kind of agreed with our team. It's like, yep, the database doesn't need, but we did, you, you're right, Keith. It's all the other stuff. The integration points is very good to be. There's also an operator that was built by the Rook community. I know Seth and that team built one for uh, Rook. Uh, and so actually mounting Seth under Rook, uh, there's an operator out there in that community that, that is actually for CockroachDB as well. So if you're into storage and those, those, that side of the world, it's really, really interesting stuff as well. Um, lots of companies using Cockroach. Uh, Y'all, we have you know hundreds of production clusters. 
Um, this is, you know, system of record workloads. Uh, it, it, this is a perfectly fit, good fit for a general purpose database as well. Um, you know, somebody in the chat had actually asked about Udemy and are we going to post things there? We actually have Cockroach University, which is a you know, free platform. Um, you know, we're growing that team like crazy right now. Um, you know, Will Cross, who's on the right-hand side of the lower there, um, they do a great job. Uh, so there's some more stuff you can learn there. Again, I can't say more about our docs. Go check out our docs. It's just amazing stuff. Um, I'm more of a person that learns that. And then finally, there's Cockroach Cloud. Uh, you know, we do run this as a service. You know, we manage it. We do provide all SRE to this. Uh, we manage uptime, all the operations. We're giving you, um, you know, all the all the infrastructure underneath. Uh, our pricing is very public and out there for you. We believe this is the lowest cost, total cost of ownership for a cloud database. Um, this is going to automate scale. You choose GCP, AWS. Um, but but you know, we're a real Cockroach Cloud. Uh, at the end of the month here, if you saw, actually, we, we took a round of investment today, which is kind of exciting, and as part of that in the announcement, we actually, uh, we're going to run a beta for a free tier of Cockroach Cloud. So we're going to run Cockroach Cloud free for everybody on the entire planet, um, up to certain storage layers or storage or I think IO uh, limits. Um, but a free instance of Cockroach is available all over the entire planet, uh, which would be really cool. Um, and that's going to be available as beta at the end of this month. And then, you know, stay tuned here for, you know, a full serverless version of Cockroach. Uh, if you think of, of fully like a Kubernetes craziness animal of a database, uh, that's where we're headed. So that'll be it'll be an interesting journey over the over the next over the next uh, couple months. So, so with that, that is Cockroach. Uh, this is I'm in marketing, so I got to give you my last uh, slide, which is a little bit of an advertisement. So. Um, Thank you everybody for joining. I don't know, Bart, if we wanted to take questions or not. I know we're over our time, um, but I yeah, I guess just really quickly, more. maybe if, if Keith could chime in on, you know, perhaps the if you found that some of the folks out there were asking new questions or ones you seem to get a lot that you maybe want to address to everybody. And before you do that, I just want to mention, as Jim said, to join our community Slack channel. Um, I've put the link in the chat, um, but you can find it. This is, it's the Cockroach DB Slack channel, and you can reach all of us. And there's lots more experts on pretty much anything you want to talk about, especially if you happen to be a Golang expert. Um, we have a lot of a Cockroach. I don't know if Jim mentioned was um, written in Go, so it's it's probably the largest Go pro project out there. Um, and we are also open source and we have a channel where we have our contributors and we are more than happy to have more contributors. So please come join the family, whether you're a part of our open source um, broader community or you just have a specific question about CockroachDB. There's a lot of experts there um, on CockroachDB, on Kubernetes, on Go, on all kinds of things. So join our community Slack channel and um, Keith, yes, please uh, continue. <laughs> Um, I mean, most of the questions are the ones that, that we get all the time, right? Um, we, um, the next level deep on this conversation is, is probably, you know, talking about the, the nuts and bolts of an individual trans distributed transaction, how we distribute authority to act across all of the nodes in the cluster, right? Um, I, I don't think I could do that service in the, in the couple of minutes that we have left. Um, I posted some links in the Q&A uh, for great documentation on the topic. I'd be happy to do a follow-up conversation with, with anyone on the call or, or with the community specifically around how distributed transactions um, work at a, at a super low level, if that's something that your, your group would be interested in, Bart. Uh, yeah, I mean, almost, cer almost certainly, so I'll probably take you up on that at some point, Keith, yeah. And maybe we get Andrew or somebody on the, on the call. I've done that. Andrew Werner is an engineer, loves to talk about transactions as well. How about a Keith, right? And so that's some really cool stuff. And I, Keith is available. I'm sorry, Keith, you're Keith at Cockroach Labs. You're Lisa Marie at Cockroach, and I'm Jim at Cockroach Labs, but Slack is always, you are Keith? Yeah, I am Keith, but I didn't really want everybody to know uh, that. Well, it's kind of, it's not me hard to well, Slack. I prefer, <laughs> I prefer everyone reach out to me on the community <laughs> Slack. I am a member of the community Slack. That way I can, um, share my answers with everyone rather than uh, on a point-to-point -point basis. Um, it's, a right. much, it's a much better better way to get the information <laughs> out there. Rather and than Jim didn't even have my email address right, but I'm also on the community Slack um, exactly. at Lisa. So that's really the best way uh, to yeah, reach right. out to us. Yep. We're on Twitter as well. I'm Software Dev Angel. Keith is on Twitter. Jim's on Twitter. Um, so you can uh, hit us up on, on Twitter and we can answer you there too. Okay, good. Uh, last but certainly not least, we always have two things that we do in, in, in all of our meetups. 
Um, one is that we really, really believe in the, the giving spirit and all of this. And as all of you have given your time uh, and the wonderful pre presentation that, uh, that Jim gave with all the support from Lisa and, and Keith answering questions, we're really all about generosity in any way possible. So every time we do a meetup, we always make a donation to The Last Mile. And if you check them out, thelastmile.org, it's an organization that helps uh, incarcerated, currently incarcerated and formerly incarcerated folks learn programming uh, to increase their, their chances of success once they're out on, once they're released. And so we're collaborating with them. Uh, we have been since last year and we're gonna start working even more closely together, hopefully to get a technical advisor, uh, a graduate from the program to be working with our community. Um, so we always make a donation to them and it will be in, in, in the three of your, your names and also uh, for Cockroach Labs. So thank you very much for, for your contributions today. And our other hey, little hey, tip, hey, yes. Hey Bart, before you move on, yeah. um, let me just commit and I'll take from marketing budget, whatever, that we'll actually match whatever donation you're gonna give. Perfect. So that cockroach is actually just going to do that. Okay. I, I, we're, we're fully believe this sort of stuff. Um, you know, it's part, right. it's it, part and part. It, I love this community, dude. Everybody, it's, 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 it's super easy. Like once you, and, and yeah. I've been lucky enough to talk to different folks that are involved. It's like, this is so obviously uh, the correct thing to do. Um, yeah. So anyway, thank you very much. That's fantastic. Yeah. And the other thing that we always do for all of our guests, um, Gorka, puedes compartir un poco is that we always, uh, while we're talking, we have a graphic recorder who's creating a visual representation of all the things that are being talked about. Oh boy. Um, so while you were going, Jim, he was trying to keep up as best he could. Um, and so anyway, so I hope we hope we were able to get as much as we could from, from the talk in there as possible. Um, we'll be uploading that to, uh, to social media. We'll send that over to you so you can have that as well. That is so cool. Oh my gosh. Bart, right. you and Demetrius, you, you just, you blow it out of the water. I mean, it's, you are the best. <laughs> you raised a really high bar for the rest of us meetup organizers. Yeah, no, no. Anyway, but when you get to meet amazing folks from all over the world, such as yourselves, like I said, this stuff gets, it, it feels quite easy. Um, there's one other surprise that you'll see in social media, but you'll see that in a couple hours. We'll have that up soon. Um, but, uh, but anyway, for the rest of the folks that are out there that maybe can join a little bit late, we'll have the talk up in the next couple of days on YouTube. It'll be shared also in the, uh, in the Cockroach Community Slack, as well as in our Slack, in many other places, so everyone will have access to that. Um, once again, thank you so much for your time. Uh, luckily, looking forward to follow up with, uh, with Keith in the future and some other folks from, from Cockroach Labs. Uh, congratulations on the great news um, as well too. I'm sure everyone will be seeing that soon. And we look forward to seeing everybody next week in our meetup with Alvaro, who will be talking all about Postgres. We got a little bit of touches on Postgres today too, so it'll be fun to incorporate that next week. Um, in the meantime, we'll see you on Slack, Twitter, and everywhere else we're at. Thanks again. Thanks, Bart. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.